Previously on Helen the Hurtgen Forest, we saw how a queer action led to the loss of half of Vossenach, and we also saw how Kommerscheid became more and more of a mess filled with various different units. Although the Americans managed to keep the Germans out of Kommerscheid, the mental state of the GIs was rapidly decreasing. The veterans had either been killed or wounded and many green recruits had taken their place. In this final episode of the series, we will take a look at the endgame of the 28th Infantry Division in the Hurtgen Forest. As light started to grow on the 7th of November 1944, the Germans started to bombard the defences at Kommerscheid. Next to the shells was the cold, almost icy rain. After several days of failed attempts to take the town, the Germans were determined more than ever to finally break the Kommerscheid defences. Finally, after the 30 minute long bombardment, the Germans attacked. Just under 20 panzers of the 16th Panzer Regiment advanced together with the infantry of the 89th Infantry Division. The Panzers inflicted heavy losses, especially to the left flank of A Company 112th Infantry Regiment. The company's command post was fired at multiple times and A Company's commander, Captain Freer, was among the wounded. On the American right flank, the Panzers managed to move in on the foxholes of Company B 112th Infantry Regiment. But thanks to personal initiatives, the Panzers were forced to back up. The heavy weapons of M Company also suffered terrible losses, but its commander, Captain Hackett, managed to avenge the loss of multiple of his mortars and heavy machine guns by knocking out one of the panzers with a bazooka. The American tanks got stuck into the fight as well. Lieutenant Bain, a platoon commander in A Company 707th Tank Battalion, managed to knock out a German tank which tried to flank the right side of the village. Bain was aided by two tank destroyers before they finally managed to bring the panzer to a crashing halt. In the centre of the hamlet, Lieutenant Edmund in his M10 managed to knock out a panther at point-blank range, and another M10 also destroyed another German tank. In return, three M10s were also quickly put out of action, including Lieutenant Edmunds. As the German tanks entered the village, Colonel Ripple and Colonel Peterson were just in time to leave their command post as one of the panzers was starting to blaze away at it. Major Hasler jumped from post to post to encourage his men to fight on but despite his best of efforts, many were already leaving their foxholes. Captain Rumborg, in command of 3rd Battalion 110th Infantry Regiment at the Woodline, was ordered up to aid in the defence, but before Rumborg could assemble his men, his orders changed as Colonel Peterson arrived at the Woodline. C Company of the 112th Infantry Regiment was committed instead. Just as Peterson had given his orders to C Company, a message arrived stating that he was expected at the divisional headquarters. Peterson at once left in a jeep. Finally, he was given the opportunity to clarify the true situation at Kommerscheid to his superiors. Colonel Ripple thus took over the command at Kommerscheid. C Company was ordered forward, but the company didn't move out of their foxholes. Even Ripple's presence was unable to convince the men of C Company to move into Kommerscheid. As more and more panzers entered Kommerscheid, more GIs started to withdraw. A few tanks were sent up to stem the tide, but it was all in vain. Two more Sherman tanks as well as a tank destroyer were destroyed in quick succession. The remaining American tanks started to drive back. Eventually only one Sherman and two M10s remained on the battlefield, and with the armor pulling back, Major Christensen of the 3rd Battalion also ordered his men to withdraw. Gradually more men withdrew, including a party of 75 men of A Company. Everything was done to establish a new defensive line at the edge of the woods overlooking the hamlet. Kommerscheid was lost to the Germans at 11.25 am. Chaos reigned on the battlefield. Units were reorganized while the wounded men poured down into the Karl Valley towards the 8th station. At the edge of the woods were the 3rd Battalion 110th Infantry Regiment, C Company of the 112th Infantry Regiment and some 200 survivors of the fighting at Kommerscheid. In order to prevent a blue-on-blue -blue incident, the Americans hardly fired an artillery round at Kommerscheid, which was still full of wounded GIs. Nonetheless, the approaches from Schmidt were continuously fired on. Just like the attack at Schmidt a few days before, the Germans didn't press home the attack. This gave the Americans valuable time to reorganize and improve the new defenses. At about 6.30pm, the Germans renewed their attacks. A handful of panzers tried to get across the open, but the artillery fire knocked out the leading panzer, and the others subsequently withdrew. The situation was somewhat restored, but the 28th Infantry Division was facing a very stressful night. 
During the day, Colonel Peterson had been ordered up to the divisional headquarters. He was to be relieved by Colonel Gustin Nelson. Peterson, meanwhile, had been forced to abandon his jeep after being fired upon by a German squad along the Karl Trail. After a trying trek across the Karl Gorge, dodging various German parties, the World War I veteran was eventually hit by a piece of shrapnel. One of the men with Colonel Peterson, Private Zeiler, was killed in the attempt to cross the woods. After spending the last stretch along the river bank crawling, the colonel had lost his energy and instead gambled on crying out his name until he was eventually picked up by two GIs, who applied morphine and brought the exhausted and wounded Peterson to the rear. As Colonel Peterson and the engineers along the car trail found out the hard way the Germans had managed to reach the trail, and it became more and more difficult to move supplies or reinforcements up to or from Kommerscheid. While the Germans were attacking Kommerscheid in force, the Americans were making plans to recapture their lost positions in front of Ossenach. At 8am, the 146th engineers who were going to perform the attack postponed it for about 15 minutes. As the American artillery lifted, the Germans immediately led down a counter barrage. First Lieutenant Meyer's 2nd platoon of C Company was ordered to recapture the houses on the left of the main street. His platoon took multiple casualties in the attempt to move up. A Company and the Captain Ball at the same time rushed ahead in order to capture the damaged church. A firefight ensued in the church which resulted in several Germans being killed and the capture of some 16 others. The men of A Company also overcame a machine gun position in the cemetery. From the cemetery position they were able to support 1st Lieutenant Meyer's advance on the left. At the same time the supporting tanks of 2nd Lieutenant Johnson, 2nd Platoon B Company of the 707th Tank Battalion also moved up to support the infantry. Although the tanks weren't of much use in the close quarters combat, they did provide moral support. The men of Meyer proceeded, house by house, capturing 19 Germans in one single building. Later during the fight, the Air Force was caught up and although most planes successfully bombed their targets, two of the P-47s mistakenly bombed the friendly lines. But in spite of this incident, most of Vosanak had been recaptured by the evening. At noon, the 109th Infantry Regiment was finally relieved by the men of the 12th Infantry Regiment of the 4th Infantry Division. The three battalions of the 109th weren't finished with the Hurtgen Forest though. After dark, the 2nd Battalion relieved the 146th Engineers in Vosanak. Of the 109th Infantry Regiment, only the 1st Battalion had received reinforcements, some 200 men in total. The 3rd Battalion on its turn was to be part of Task Force Davis, which was ordered to recapture Schmidt. The Task Force further consisted of the 112th Infantry Regiment minus its 2nd Battalion, Companies A and C of the 707th Tank Battalion, and Companies B and C of the 893rd Tank Destroyer Battalion. All forces were desperately under strength, and the tanks had received a blow during the fighting for Kommerscheid. Besides, the tank destroyers of the task force still had to cross the Karl Trail, which was infested with Germans. Nonetheless, General Davis, in command of the task force, ordered the tank destroyers under his command to immediately cross the trail. While the M10s were moving up, the 3rd Battalion of the 109th proceeded to the Karl Bridge. Or at least that's what they thought they were doing. In theory, the 3rd Battalion had lost its way, and they eventually ended up behind the 110th Infantry Regiment to the southwest. In order to conform with the General's wishes, four M10s of B Company's 2nd Platoon were ordered to make a dash for the Karl Trail. As the four tank destroyers broke the cover of Ossanok at about 3pm, they were met by a hail of fire coming from across the valley. Two M10s received a direct hit and were knocked out, while another was hit in the dry sprocket and veered off. The fourth and last tank destroyer made it to the wood line, but they went too fast and slid off the path, plunging into the valley below. Although badly shaken, the crew made it out alive. During the day, General Koto, in command of the 28th Infantry Division, had a meeting with the 5th Corps and 1st Army commanders in which he suggested that his troops be withdrawn across the Karl stream. Both the Corps and Army commanders agreed. It was the beginning of the end. While the 1055th Infantry Regiment had successfully captured Kommerscheid, the men of the 156th and 60th Panzergrenadier Regiments had to give up the eastern part of Ossenach to the American engineers. At the same time, however, the Germans were able to infiltrate the lines along the Karl Trail. 
On the next day, November 8th, the 3rd Battalion of the 109th Infantry Regiment was called out again to proceed to the Gull River, from where they were to act as the basis of the withdrawal across the stream. They eventually arrived at the Carl Trail at 1pm. L Company stayed behind between Simonskal and the bridge at the Mestrenge Mühle in order to provide flank protection. In the meantime, contact was established with Colonel Nelson and eventually with Colonel Ripple as well. The commanders on the field quickly made plans for a smooth withdrawal across the Carl stream. At the wood line in front of Kommerscheid, the day was appearing to be pretty calm until six German panzers were spotted around Kommerscheid. But thanks to the counter-artillery, the German attack never really materialized. The Germans tried again during the afternoon, but with the help of the M10 tank destroyers of Lt. Davis across the valley at Fossenach, all six of the German panzers were reported as knocked out. As Colonel Nelson finally arrived at the wood line, measures were taken to start the process of the withdrawal. The wounded were being brought back and L Company of the 110th was chosen as the covering force. As darkness fell, the artillery would lay down a covering barrage to conceal the withdrawal. The withdrawal itself consisted of two parts, a group with the wounded and a group with the men who were still fit to fight, some 300 fighting men in total. As the men set out, German mortar fire started to fall near the Carl Trail and the men were forced to spread out. As it was dark, the reorganization of the group was nearly impossible. Colonel Nelson with his group made it safely past a column of wounded GIs and also managed to cross the car bridge to safety. The wounded meanwhile walked on until they came across the Germans guarding the bridge. After a bit of negotiating, all men of the group were allowed to pass, including the armed soldiers who were carrying some of the wounded. The withdrawal was a success, most of the scattered parties managed to make their way across the stream to the designated assembly area. The group with Colonel Ripple was one of these scattered parties which eventually reached the 3rd Battalion 109th Infantry Regiment. Only a few soldiers didn't make it. Others did make it but went to Vossenach instead, like Lieutenant Flagg who you might remember from the battles at Kommerscheid. Over at Hürtgen, the 12th Infantry Regiment immediately sent out one battalion to eliminate a German salient along the Weiserweh Creek. The battalion was unable to make good progress and eventually turned back to the initial start line. To the south at Raffelsband, the 2nd Battalion 110th Infantry Regiment made an attempt to attack the German-held pillboxes, but their attack was repulsed. During the night everything was done to give the wounded of Komarscheid the treatment they needed, but as the aid stations became crowded, the walking wounded were simply advised to walk back to the rear and seek medical attention there. Several parties along the Carl Trail were harassed by the Germans overlooking the only supply route of the Americans. That same day, the 112th Infantry Regiment received some 500 replacements to bring the battalions back to combat strength. The next day, November 9th, the weather went from bad to worse with snow falling on the 28th Infantry Division's positions. The already difficult task of getting vehicles through became even more difficult now that snow was falling down. That 9th of November, Major Bernd, the surgeon of the 112th Infantry Regiment, asked his superiors if he could set up a truce to bring in the wounded still left on the battlefield. His suggestion was declined, and the response he got was that he should instead find out what the Germans thought of such a truce. Major Bernd then moved up to the aid station at the Carl Trail to see the situation for himself. Unaware that the division had by then authorized a truce, Bernd and his interpreter went out to the bridge on their own to seek the German commander in the area. Eventually a lieutenant came out to meet them. Bernd was surprised to hear that all the wounded along the wood line at Kommerscheid had already been taken away, but there was still the situation at the aid station which was piled with wounded men awaiting evacuation. The German officer agreed that his men would let the evacuation vehicles pass, but he couldn't vouch for the German artillery. Both Americans and Germans worked together in order to evacuate the wounded. Later, problems arose on the Carl Trail closer to Fossenach when the German captain was unaware of the truce. The German officer insisted that only the seriously injured soldiers and the medical personnel could be evacuated. Slowly but surely, the wounded were evacuated under the close watch of the German captain and his men. By that time, the German 89th Infantry Division had relieved almost the entirety of the 116th Panzer Division, which was shifted to Hürtgen for a new German attack on the salient, held by the 12th Infantry Regiment of the 4th Infantry Division. On the 10th of November, unaware of the new German peril at Hürtgen, the Americans attacked to even their lines. 
The 1st Battalion of the 109th had to take over from the 112th Infantry Regiment, since the latter consisted nearly entirely of fresh recruits. The 109th partially reached their objectives. On the 11th of November, a new truce was established, this time by a German medical officer who wanted to collect the German dead in the Karl Gorge. The Americans were given time to find a new route, avoiding the German captain to the north. Eventually, the entire US 8th station was evacuated. The next day, the 110th Infantry Regiment made yet another attempt to capture the Raffelspan's pillboxes, but the companies were so worn down that the attack never really materialised. All elements of the 112th Infantry Regiment were finally relieved after the 2nd Ranger Battalion was attached to the 109th Infantry Regiment on the 14th of November. On the 17th of November, with the arrival of the 8th Infantry Division, the 110th Infantry Regiment was also relieved and moved out of the Zimonskal sector. The relief of the 28th Infantry Division was completed by the 19th of November, as the 8th Infantry Division also took over the positions of the 109th Infantry Regiment. The 28th Infantry Division was finally out of the front line at Fossenach and Hürtgen. In November of 1944, the 28th Infantry Division had suffered 5,684 casualties, and if you add attached units, the sad total comes to 6,184. The hardest hit regiment was the 112th, which deplored 2,093 casualties. 232 were captured, 431 men were missing, a further 719 were wounded, while 167 men were killed. The regiment also had 544 non-battle casualties. The Germans also endured heavy losses. It is estimated that they had some 2,000 casualties of all types. The Americans also lost 16 of the 20 M10 tank destroyers and 31 out of the 50 tanks in the endeavour to capture Schmidt. The Hurtgen campaign of the 28th Infantry Division had come to an end. The soldiers had behaved well under trying conditions, but casualties were incredibly high. The attack to take Schmidt and act as a divergent for other American attacks had failed. The one-way supply route which was the Carl Trail was a major factor which led to the eventual defeat. So was the weather and the quick move by the 116th Panzer Division. I hope you enjoyed this series, I most certainly did making it. I thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you in a future video. Don't forget to like and subscribe and do leave a comment down below. Cheers!